how did you feel once you got announced that you were like coming back and then the overwhelming um like enthusiasticness that the, the the fans had how did that feel for you it, it was it was crazy like we i mean we broke up in in 1998 and i've been the guy that that kept touring and i was the guy that kept like being in a band and doing my thing and uh the other guys hadn't. So I was like, over the years, I, I had a lot of people come up to me like, oh, I love Refused, you know, you're playing with some other band, and people come up and they say how much shape meant to them or Refused meant to them. So I kind of had an inkling of, of like the influence that we had as a band. Well, the other guys, I think they're completely clueless. They were living in Sweden, doing their own thing, just like not involved in the music scene really. But the day we posted uh, on Facebook, I just posted like, we posted photos as Refused 2012. And, like the internet broke it, it fucking, we were like on Twitter like in the world we were like trending as number one in the world of everything that happened that day like refused reunion is like the number one thing that was scary it was like really like because so here's the deal like we, we we all lived in the same city we we moved back together so we all lived in the same city and we were all hanging out and, and then we got the offer from Coachella we started talking and we we're like oh maybe we should do it and I remember um David called me up and he said, don't talk to anyone. Just let everybody kind of, you know, make up their own minds. And I'm like, all right. And I, I didn't think about it because we got the offer a bunch of times. But it, we always turned it down. So I was like, eh, it's not going to happen. And then David calls me back like a couple of weeks later. I totally forgot about it. And he just said, all right, we're doing it. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, what do you mean? Should we, should we not get together, practice, see how it feels? He's like, no, no, we're doing it. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's crazy. So when we posted that we're going to get back together, this was before we ever practiced and people lost it and I'm like oh shit this is really scary because now you know we have to up our game you know so yeah. it was a bit it was a bit scary but I mean the reception was ph phenomenal and we always look at 2012 as like um, our victory lap that's how we call it like there was <laughs> just a victory lap we just did like yay and now we're back with a new record it's work again. It's it is different. I mean, it's like the the, the attitude's a bit different. So it's it's kind of cool. That was like an enamel in life that you got to do the victory lap once. You know. <laughs> in the in the earlier days when you're playing like the squats and the cafes and it's a little bit more um, lively and I presume a little bit more you know drunkenness and kind of crazy parties and all that I kind of want to know what was the um, what was the kind of most punk rock for lack of a better term thing you've seen in, in like the early days oh wow we, once we played a, we played a uh, like a mini festival in, in south of Sweden with some uh, like really crusty punk bands and we, we kind of stuck out like a sore thumb but you know and then there was like a mini riot that happened and we're just standing there outside because we're all like at that we're all straight edge we're all like we didn't drink we're just standing there and there's this like maybe like it wasn't maybe like eight punks with mohawks start attacking the police and we're just like this is not going to end well for these guys and it was really like kind of like you know like middle finger in the air like it was so punk because it was so like they were so outnumbered, I'm like, well, oh, this is pretty rad though. Like with their mohawks, they were like, fuck the pigs, and I'm like, yeah, that's cool. I, I remember like a uh, police bus driving away, and there's like a punk like hanging on the windshield, like screaming, and we're like, oh, this is this is pretty cool. That was pretty punk. That was a good good times. <laughs> You would have met a lot of other famous um, punk rock artists and bands and musicians. Who was the most unexpectedly, um, just surprisingly not punk at all, of the punk rocks? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it's interesting because you meet a lot of people. Uh, we just did a, a, a Australian tour with it. We had an opening band called Sick of It All. Yeah. And they're like an old school hardcore band. They've been together for 30 years. And they're so kind of normal, just blue collar Americans. Like, like they're, I mean, they're in their, they're, you know, they're turning 50, they're in, you know, and they're just kind of normal dudes. I mean, they, I, I guess at one point they were super punk and super yeah. hardcore, but now they're just like, this is their job and they just work really hard. So that's kind of interesting how you see people, when you meet, when, when everyone's young, 
like how you define yourself as, as an individual and like like kind of the subculture references are really important because that's a part of uh, forming your own identity. But then when people grow older, they're just like, oh, I just love punk. And it's not like it's a big deal. It's just something that you are. I mean, that's the same thing with me. I don't look like a punk. I don't dress like a punk. I don't act like a punk. I love punk music. I collect hardcore records. I still, you know, part of that scene. But I just like, it's not important when you're older to define yourself like that it's just like a matter of like the ideas that you bring further into life and you meet a lot of people i think for me the most interesting thing is when you meet people that seem like just kind of normal and then they start talking about like their punk rock like history or past yeah so that's kind of i i was um i was at the transfer bus at an airport and this like 55 year old dude in like weird shorts and a mustache he looked like uh a complete like normal guy and he's sitting there on a bus and I'm, I have a, a bag like a record store bag and, and uh, there's a record store in Los Angeles called Amoeba Records which is like the biggest one of the biggest and he looks at my bag and he says uh, Amoeba Records is that a production company or what I'm like no it's a record store and he says it's also a song by the adolescents which is like an old 80s punk band and I'm like Yes, it is. And then I had to get off the bus, but I'm like this like 55 year old man that looked like he, he looked like nothing like the antithesis of punk. But then he just threw that on me. I'm like, I have to leave. But but yes, you're right. It's other lessons. It's crazy. But I love those encounters. It's like it's so unexpected. And so I'm like, oh, I used to be like a super punk. And you're like, oh, wow. Yeah. I love that. That's pretty cool. And then I guess what about the opposite? Someone you've met who you're expecting to be punk rock and you kind of had to stand back and be like, whoa, that's a little bit. It's a little bit too punk rock. Yeah. Have you had any of those sort of moments with people? I met a... There is a band called... Uh, uh, Leftover Crack. Well, just if you call your band Leftover Crack, <laughs> then you're, I guess you're, you're in for it. But uh, the, the singer in Leftover Crack, he was such a handful. He was like a heroin addict, like full on. I'm just like trying to tour with him. I'm like, this is just not working out because he was, he was like... Yeah, it was, was a bit too much. <laughs> a bit too much for me, you know. I'm sure a lot of people could get along with him, but I was just like, oh. You, know. you have to realize that a lot of the people that became punks late 70s, early 80s, they were, and, and there are still punks today, they were real freaks. It wasn't like, it wasn't like a costume that you could put on and be like, oh, I'll be punk for a while and then I won't. But they were genuine freaks. They're like the misfits, the, the, the complete outsiders, outcast. And I mean, if you read the NoFX book, a lot of the friends just died. Heroin addicts. And, and it was like kind of a, a dark scene because people were so fucked up. And then, I mean, you know, some people make it and some people kind of adjust to sort of adjust to the world and sort of make, a, make their way. But uh, it's interesting when you meet people that we, we call like lifers, that people are just, they're just going to do this forever. And interesting to see because most of the lifer people that are still doing it or are going to do it forever, we're very, it, there's a lot of undiagnosed people, I tell you. It's like a lot of people that just, yeah, you should, we should be locked away somewhere or be on medication, but instead we play music, which I think is kind of society's way to be like, let's just put the musicians over here and we're going to do their thing and, you know, they'll be, they'll be cleared away. So I think that's what it is, literally. You know.